Welcome to the Twimmel AI Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Machine learning models are increasingly used in business, government, and other settings that require users to understand the model's predictions. Interest in these use cases, combined with the increased popularity of opaque machine learning models like deep learning, has led to the development of a thriving field of model explainability, research, and practice. Next week, on Tuesday, August 11th, we're bringing together experts and researchers to explore the current state of model explainability and some of the key emerging ideas shaping the field. Our panel, which includes experts from Cornell, Carnegie Mellon, Harvard, IBM, and more, will be on hand to share their unique perspectives in this area and to answer your questions about model explainability. You don't want to miss this discussion. For more information and to register, visit twimmelaicom slash explainability forum. Before we dive into today's show, I'd like to send a huge thanks to our friends at Qualcomm for their support of the podcast. Qualcomm AI Research is dedicated to advancing AI to make its core capabilities, perception, reasoning, and action ubiquitous across devices. Their work makes it possible for billions of users around the world to have AI-enhanced experiences on Qualcomm Technologies powered devices. To learn more about what Qualcomm is up to on the research front, visit twimmelaicom slash Qualcomm. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone, I am on the line with Max Welling. Max is Vice President of Technologies at Qualcomm Technologies Netherlands and a full professor at the University of Amsterdam. Max was a guest of the podcast uh, just about a little bit over a year ago uh, in May of last year, where we talked about gauge equivariant CNNs, generative models, and the future of AI. And I am super excited to welcome you back to the show, Max, to uh, catch up on what you've been up to and dig into some really interesting topics. Hi, Sam. Thank you for having me again on the show. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Uh, you you may know this, but last year's podcast that, that we did was the second most popular show uh, of the year. So it was the, the second most downloaded show for the, the podcast, and I am sure this one will be uh, just as hot. Uh, so looking forward to digging into it. Before we jump into our topics, which include topics like neural augmentation, federated learning, graph neural networks. Give us an update on what you've been up to at Qualcomm and the, you know, the current focus of your research at the university. Yeah, so um, I think many of the topics that we've talked about last year are still um, you know, hotly pursued at the university and at Qualcomm. Um, so we're doing a lot of generative modeling um, where we look at you know, how can we build models that can generate high dimensional data like images and, and audio in a very realistic way, trained completely unsupervised from, from data. We are also looking at still at um, invariances and uh, sort of symmetries in data and how we can embed those into these models. Um, and in particular, uh, also looking at graph neural networks with applications now also to, to molecules. So uh, we've started sort of a project um, where we try to predict the properties of molecules and that you know can be very naturally modeled with a graph neural net because you know a molecule is a little bit like a graph. Um, and we've made these models also symmetric to rotations in, in, in 3D space. So if I take a molecule and I rotate it around, then sort of the internal representations of that neural network need to transform in a coherent way um, under these rotations. Um, and since it's a graph neural net, it's also, it is also symmetric under permutations of the nodes. Um, and so all of these symmetries are built into the neural network and uh, sort of being trying to predict properties for drugs, for instance, and in, in the context of, uh, you know, uh, see if we can find something that is good against uh, COVID. Um, but we've also looked at uh, efficient uh, learning Tra you know, training neural networks with very limited precision. This is mostly work that's being done at Qualcomm because, of course, we want to run our phones in, in, in the sort of 
lowest with the lowest amount of energy and so uh, to to have the highest accuracy but using the least amount of power possible um mm. and so we've been a lot of research in in trying to make these uh, sort of comp- so these neural network computations very low precision and as a sort of an additional sort of new track in there we've also been looking at quantum computation now in in multiple ways so first of all quantum chips might be around the corner can we train can, can we design good neural networks that would uh, run on quantum chips, but also to just look at the mathematics of these um, of of quantum mechanics and see if that quantum if that mathematics is is sort of a new language uh, even for classical neural networks. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of things happening, and then and then there's of course the neural augmentation that we will be talking about. Uh, we have been applying these ideas to different application areas in wireless communication, um, also at the university, but also at Qualcomm, for instance, to um, to MIMO detection and also to uh, error correction decoding and now also to, uh, to channel estimation. Awesome. Awesome. Interesting to hear you bring up uh, quantum and quantum machine learning. Um, you know, is that something we can maybe spend a few minutes on? I, I'm yeah. curious on your, your overall take. I've been trying to uh, myself to get a sense for whether I think it's you know worthy of all the hype it's getting and how far away it is and uh, how relevant it is to machine learning and, and AI. What, what's your take on it? Yeah, we could easily spend an hour on this. I'm very, very excited <laughs> about this stuff. Um, so, so for me at this point, um, it is mostly intellectually interesting. Mm. Um, and so I have a physics background. So uh, my my supervisor was uh, Gerard at Hoft, who is a who won a Nobel Prize on sort of standard model uh, quantum uh, standard model quantum mechanics, and he has a very particular and interesting view on quantum mechanics, which is very controversial, I would say. Hmm. But um, and 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 the view is that in fact um, there is a world there which is an ontological world the world is just in a classical state at the very very small smallest level we don't know what that state is or what the even how to describe it and so the mathematics to describe that sort of just classical cellular automata is happens to be quantum mechanics so quantum mechanics is a mathematical tool like complex analysis is a mathematical tool to solve to the partial differential equations and ordinary diff- differential equations. So it's quantum mechanics is sort of a mathematical tool to describe sort of the world if you don't know all the microscopic degrees of freedom um, very well. And so while there's a whole sort of debate going on in the physics community, it turns out that that particular view of the world is very interesting to apply to neural networks. And and sort of that to me is is sort of what I'm currently very interested in. So that's really just applying mathematics of quantum mechanics to uh, sort of neural network research. Um, now, how about, you know, so this, of course, this this language is very well suited, you know, for actually running on a quantum computer. So it's, it's precisely the correct language in the end, so that these things which are, you know, exponentially complex to compute classically, you can actually speed it up, you know, on a, on a quantum computer. Now, whether quantum computers are around the corner is very hard to predict clearly, but the fact that we now see a lot of activity, not just in the big companies, but we even see startups, and the startups are, are quite well funded um, to try to produce sort of quantum computers and you know and software and chips, um, to me, says that we are pretty close. So, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if in 10 years we have something that's pretty reasonable, we can actually do some computations on. Um, but it's probably going to be a hybrid system. It's probably going to be a system where, you know, do a bit of a classical computation, and then for a part of that where you want to speed up, you would send it to a quantum computer who would do that part of the computation, spit the result back at you. You know, it's a probabilistic result, and then you would keep continue, you know, learning or or, or computing with that particular result you got from the quantum computer. So for a while, probably systems will will look like like hybrid systems like that. Mm-hmm. But there is, I can certainly predict that that you know, that whole research area is about to explode and that there's going to be a, a huge amount of interest also from the AI community um, in in quantum algorithms. Uh, have you seen any interesting results along the lines of applying quantum mechanics as a mathematical tool to neural networks or are we still too early yet? 
No, we have uh, we actually do have a paper together with my collaborator Roberto Bondesan, also at Qualcomm. We we do have a paper where we we basically start with a classical neural net. We just say, okay, this is a, the, it's something that a classical neural net typical do, typically computes. Now, tr- let, let's say, what do we need to do in order to compute that you know, to put that on a quantum computer? So the first step is to say, okay, how can I efficiently run a classical neural net on a quantum computer. Maybe strange, because why would you do that? Um, but you learn a lot about the language of quantum mechanics if you force yourself to go through that procedure. So once we've done that, we now ask, okay, can we now slightly deform that classical neural net into the quantum regime? So not like full-blown you know, quantum, but let's say, just make a small perturbation of that classical system into the quantum regime and see if we can then still perhaps do classically even um, sort of fast computations and just see if we can improve you know the the, the models that we design with our classical tools uh, with this new sort of earned degree of freedom that you now have this quantum degree of freedom which is sort of where you can now start modeling in so we have we have done that and there's also a lot of other people who have but mostly the research is about you know how can I design good quantum algorithms on quantum computers but I think that that's maybe too limited of a scope to think about mm-hmm Mm-hmm. Uh, so one of the things that we wanted to talk about is your uh, work looking at what you call neural augmentation um, and some various applications of that. When you say neural augmentation, you know, do you mean that in the colloquial sense of you know augmenting human intelligence with you know neural networks and AI, or do you mean something different? So the way I mean it is um, before the sort of the deep neural network sort of explosion, people, and, and also in other communities, like in, in science, the scientific community or the signal processing community, people have sort of hand-designed algorithms that were very smart and that worked very well, and there was a lot of deep thought going into these algorithms when they designed these algorithms. So there's a lot of knowledge in some sense embodied in these algorithms. And, and if you look at the sciences, of course, people write down sort of a partial differential equations to to model the world, right? And um, so there is like centuries of sort of scientific research that is basically embodied in these equations. Um, even though the equations might look simple, right, there's a lot of knowledge that is embodied in these equations. Yet, um, you can ask yourself, when the world is very complex, like if you're trying to model the internet or something like that, Mm -hmm. um, you can ask yourself, is our imagination strong enough to to model all these small little details, you know, that might be going on in such a complex system? And, you know, for me, the answer is clearly no. Maybe there's exceptions. Maybe somehow physics at the very fundamental level is simple and you could write it down, you know very simply with a few parameters or no parameters. But systems out there in the real world, um, like for instance, human interactions are so complicated that you know every model that we write, write down is, is, is way too limited. Um, and so then the question is, can we enhance those models that we write down with hands, with our hands, right? So let's say uh, when we write down a model for COVID transmission, like transmission of diseases, we have a model that's called SIR models that sort of model how uh, sort of the virus is transmitted. We can make it increasingly complex by studying, you know, how things, you know, are transmitted in the world. Um, but then still you could argue, well, have I really modeled all the details of this problem? And so then you can say, well, it maybe the world is too complex. Maybe there's many, many sort of patterns in that data that I just can't really write down. So let me just try to just collect data and then make a predictor, train a neural network that tries to predict these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So that's the other part, you know, side of the regime, right? You can either collect a huge amount of data and train predictors, or you can have one of these models that you sort of hand designed and just run it with no parameters. So now the question is, is there something in the middle? Can you say something where you start off with your with your engineering solution or your scientific model and then say, well, let's not completely throw it away, but let's just correct it let's just think okay, this is an iterative algorithm that that you know makes makes changes on the way as it iterates now let's give it nudges at every iteration let's nudge it in the right direction and the way we're going to nudge it is with a neural network that is being trained on on data and so the advantage of this is that you 
you can do with much less data because um, there are you know, most of the signal, most most of the problem is already modeled by the engineering solution. And the other thing is that it's it's usually much better when you move it out of the context in which it is trained. So if you train a neural network in one context, like you, you try to predict, let's say, something on a white skin, right? And then you say, now, now let's try to do the same thing on a black skin, but you haven't actually trained it on that skin, or well, then it will completely fail. But if you train a model that the only thing it needs to do is to sort of model corrections or small little changes to an algorithm that already worked for all types of skin, right? then those changes transfer a lot better from one domain to the next domain. And so there's, there's a lot of advantages, in my opinion, about trying to, to augment a model rather than to completely train it from scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a super interesting topic for me and one that has... Uh you know, a thread that I've been pulling on, you know, back from the, the earliest interviews that I've did this idea of hybrid uh, systems, a lot of those conversations uh, and the work, at least my impression uh, from the, the interviews I've done have focused on, you know, we've kind of the pendulum has, has swung to kind of these statistical uh, approaches, you know, but we have this knowledge of physical systems. Let's try to incorporate the knowledge of the physical systems, the engineering, engineered solutions, as you might put it, into the, the, the neural models in some way. What I'm hearing here is kind of the, you know, I don't know if it's the opposite approach, but a, a, a different approach or coming at it from a different angle, which is, you know, adding a, an element of the, uh, the neural to the engineered solution. Is that, is that a significant uh, distinction? And, and am I getting that right? I think you're getting it right, but it, it so we've under this sort of name of neural augmentation, we've trained models which are either close to one side of the spectrum or the other side of the spectrum. So we have trained models which are, you know, very heavy on parameters, but that when it looks like an ordinary neural net or a current neural net, but it internally it it understands the actually the generative process by which the data was being generated. So it's trying to reconstruct something. Like it's trying to reconstruct, you know, a high resolution image. And every iteration when it tries to do that, it looks at that image and says, well, what if I would send this this particular image through my my noisy observation process? What would I see? And then compare that with the actual observations. Right, and then look at that difference, and then feed that difference back in your neural net, and then keep iterating. So that's basically a neural net, but that's aware of the of the physical sort of, you know, generative process of the data. On the other side of the spectrum, we've also looked at, you know, take a classical solution, let's say for tracking a channel, let's take a, a channel in, in in wireless communication. You know, the, the channel changes all the time, but you need to understand the actual channel specifics in order to reliably send information over the channel. So you're trying to track that channel over time. So there you could start with a model that's very close, you know, to the to the to the engineering solution, which is some kind of Kalman filter. And then you can say, well, if things go well, don't touch it. Right? But if if something starts to change and, and it's not well captured by my current Kalman filter, now just nudge it and change it a little bit with this learned module, which is you can call a prosthesis, right? Some neural prosthesis, which is there, it turns on or it does nothing when it doesn't need to, but it 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 corrects if if it senses that you know it's the the classical solution is is veering away from what what it should be doing. So so I think you can easily be on both sides of the spectrum with this kind of hybrid technology. Um, it depends a lot on your on your data and your use case. Right. I mean, if you're in, in, in language modeling, there's so much data um, and, you, and you don't really go out of that domain that you can basically be on, all on this side, completely on the side of the deep learning uh, solutions. But in other application areas, like in sometimes in, in medical uh, sort of medical areas where you have very few data, you can't you can't really get a lot of data because there's privacy concerns there. It might be better to just nudge a little bit. So that's a, a, a sort of a classical solution. Mm -hmm. So it's not. Uh, necessarily a strong statement that, you know, one approach is the, the right approach or a more promising approach, rather, you know, thinking of there being a spectrum of hybridness and being able to kind of operate at different points in the spectrum, depending on the problem is, you know, what, what opens up uh, opportunities for you. 
Yeah, that's yeah, that's certainly uh, well put. Um, I think the other thing you can think about is uh, so what, if we ever want to get to human level intelligence, right? So what do we need for that, right? I don't think we will ever have enough data to train models for every possible situation that we are in. So think about the self-driving car, right? I mean, it can be in so many different situations if you drive through a city and there's so many cities. I think it'd be, it will be very hard to just say, well, let's just do everything with a neural net. So there you probably want to put in sort of prior knowledge. Yeah, so in terms of human intelligence, humans are clearly very good at just looking at a few examples and then extrapolating from that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that flexibility or that learning from very few examples or the generalization ability. I think we need a, a lot more generative modeling in order to achieve that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the counterpoint there is, you know, I may, you know, I may understand that, you know, when I throw a, a ball or projectile or something, it's going to have a kind of para parabolic trajectory. Uh, but I certainly, uh, as a kid who knows that, I don't know the equation uh, for that. It is the suggestion that, you know, to, to get to human-like intelligent, we're going to, you know, one of our cheats is going to be providing a lot of these equations that we've figured out over time. Uh, and, and that helps us or? Yeah, maybe maybe it's easier, it's easier to compare this with evolution. So to so learning as a, as a species, let's say all of humanity, you know, has two time scales. There's the long time scale of training uh, through evolution, right? And then there's the short time scale, which is I get born with some innate abilities to see things. I mean, probably throwing things and seeing things, you know, flowing through the air, uh, it, it comes very natural to me somehow because I've sort of, you know, probably innate ability, like a, like an innate ability to learn language fast and things like this. So you could argue that as a community, we're building AI systems and machine learning systems, um, and we are learning from each other as a community. And then every time we build something new, why not put in a lot of that, those things that we already understand about the world? Right, so we don't have to train this each system from scratch all the time. Like as a, as a human, we get born. We don't have to learn everything from scratch every time again. We we, we basically we are being handed sort of s certain innate abilities by our ancestors in some sense in our brains that we can then use again to learn quickly. In, in the example you mentioned with the uh, wireless channel tracking and and common Kalman filters. You know, often with these kind of engineered solutions, you've got some, you know, equation or set of equations that's fairly well understood. And you've got like a, you know, magic parameter, you know, or two or, you know, some number of them that either you are able to, to kind of in a perfect world, you're able to calculate, you know, based on uh, principle, you know, in, in the real world or in noisy situations, maybe you you guess and I'm envisioning that, you know, where you're introducing the neural augmentation here is, you know, guessing at that parameter better. Is that a, an oversimplification for what's happening in, in these kinds of models? Yeah, a little bit maybe, because, because I would say having a few parameters in your classical model is probably full squarely on the, on the, on the classical sort of approach. So you, you have to imagine that you're actually building a neural network with a whole lot of parameters, you know, I think millions of parameters that is running alongside the classical solution, um, that is receiving input from the classical solution as well as from other observations. And it's sort of doing its own computations, but instead of trying to compute, you know, to compute and predict the entire signal, it's just trying to compute the difference you know, of the real signal and the signal produced by the classical system. So it has a much easier task, but it is a full-blown system with a lot of parameters and a full neural net or a graph neural net. Um, so it uses the full machinery of deep learning in that sense. Um, maybe you have to regularize it heavily because, you know, maybe you don't need as many parameters, but we know how to do this very well these days. But it's, it's really a true deep learning system running alongside the classical solution that is interacting with the classical solution in a way to sort of work together optimally. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I think I was envisioning something where you had the full neural network, but ultimately what it was trying to do was help you 
uh, better estimate some small number of parameters in a classical model. And it sounds like that's not really what you're suggesting. It, it the picture I'm creating now is almost more like a, you know, generative adversarial network where you've got, you know, the classical model providing kind of a source of, you know, ground truth or, or, you know, it's probably too, uh, an overloaded term, but it's version of what the world will look like. And then you've got this neural network model that is, you know, providing a, you know, its version of what the world will look like based on the data. And you're trying to kind of correct between the two. Yeah. So, so generative zero networks are a particular way of training uh, certain networks. So these networks are actually not trained in this particular way, but as, as a game um, between two networks. But, you know, to, to some degree it's correct that, you know, you have two systems interacting with each other, right? And sort of um, improving each other or helping each other. So in this case, so in the GAN, it's competitive. So they compete with each other. So in, in this model, it's cooperative. So the two systems 100% cooperate. They try to, there's one goal at the end and both try to reach the same goal. And we sort of back propagate through this whole system. Um, and these two systems are cooperating to, to reach that goal. Where in a GAN, the interesting thing is that they actually, there is no single objective. There's just two objectives that compete. And somehow, by competing over these over their own objectives, um, sort of both systems gets better. So that's a bit of a different philosophy, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, other applications beyond the the channel tracking, or what are some of the other applications that you've looked at for this approach beyond the channel tracking? Yeah. So within uh, Qualcomm, we are now just starting to think about um, how to apply this to physical design and chips. So. It's uh, we ha- we haven't done a huge amount of work, but um, it feels like this approach is uh, could be very interesting for uh, sort of physical design and chips, or so sort of a place and route kind of problems. And at a mathematical sort of abstract level, how that looks like is I have a whole bunch of components, small little cells that I need to sort of put on a canvas, um, and and you also you know all of these small little pieces also need to be routed to each other so they need to communicate with each other because they have to run a program together in some sense right but they have to be placed in a two-dimensional sort of canvas you know and and then there is millions and millions if not hundreds of millions of these components that need to be placed in in a way that the whole thing functions correctly which is like an immensely complicated exercise and there's like hundreds of engineers that work on this for months and they sit together and then each 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 of them owns a little piece of that that sort of chip, and then they say, you know, I need a little bit more space, you know, to put my component in, and you know, can I have a little bit of your space? And then mm-hmm. the other person sees, and 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 then they interact with sort of systems that compute, you know, um, if this is feasible, if 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 the components that need to be placed on that particular subspace um, can actually fit in, and it's a whole complicated process. I, when I've looked at that, I've been incredibly impressed by you know what what these engineers all do together. At the same time. Uh, this is ripe for machine learning applications, and, and uh, some companies have indeed started to look at the problem like that. So this is a very complex combinatorial optimization problem, where you know you have to sort of put these, design the shapes and put the shapes on a canvas like a puzzle, so that the whole thing sort of fits, and also all the components that need to communicate can communicate with each other without having huge long wire wires to connect them. Mm-hmm. And so here you can think of, okay, what is, can we write down a, a, a combinatorial optimization tool that if I sort of look at every iteration of a step of that tool, right, can I think of that as, as one layer of a neural net? And then can I try to figure out, can I then have my combinatorial optimization tool run together with a neural network that tries to sort of interact with that combinatorial optimization tool in order to get a better solution to this problem? And the key here, which is very interesting to me, in my opinion, is that instead of trying to solve each problem again and again and again, you can now create a whole bunch of these problems and sort of learn from all of these problems, sort of common patterns of what it means to solve one of these problems efficiently. And then again, you can transfer that knowledge from one problem to the next problem, which is just a generalization performance. And sort of at the university, at some point with... uh, of uh, Arthur Kohl and Hacker von Hof, who, were, who was a PhD student at the university. For instance, we looked at a problem like that for 
a traveling salesman's problem, which is a combinatorial optimization problem where you try to visit a number of cities as you go around and you have to sort of end up, you know, make a, make a full circle through all the cities, but the, the total amount of distance that you travel, you want to minimize. And so we showed there that, you know, there, there is a lot of classical solutions, which are very powerful, um, but you can also attack this with these machine learning tools and learn common patterns um, in, in solving these particular problems. And this is, for instance, very useful when you sort of are halfway through a solution and then some, something changes quickly, right? So it's like you're delivering your stuff and then somebody says, well, you know, this person doesn't want anything anymore or, you know, you, you, should, you should skip this in this city, right? Then instead of recomputing the whole solution to this problem, you can just use your trained machine learning algorithm and, and sort of embed that new constraint and then, and then keep going. Again, this, the augmentation part here is I have a combinatorial optimization solver and I have a neural network that looks at many problems at the same time. And this neural network is going to talk to the, to the solver and say, why don't you do this? Or why don't you suggest, you know, why don't you make this move? Or, you know, this move at this phase in your optimization problem for this type of problem is a very good phase, for, for a very good step for you to take now. Right. And so that's, that's how that couldn't be applied to, uh, to this kind of chip design. And in this case, are you using kind of feed forward networks or reinforcement learning or combination of, um, you know, have you tried different solutions here? So some companies, uh, like there's been a, a paper uh, by Google recently, um, they have used reinforcement learning for this particular problem. So, but, but I think the, the, the general philosophy is more general. So you, you, you can take any solver and then unroll it. Just think of it as every iteration of that solver, right? Let's say it, it takes 100 steps in order to come to a solution. So think of every step as one layer in a neural network. And then you just have this backbone, which is a, a fixed set of steps, which is what the solver gives you. And then around it, you build your neural network, you know, flexible transformations that will, you know, and, 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 and neurons that store information that you can read and write from um, that somehow perturb and change and suggest things to this to this backbone uh, solver, and you know this model that that does the uh, sort of suggest you know the optimization could be a reinforcement learning tool uh, or 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 or, th or sort of algorithm, but it could also be something else. It doesn't have to be that. In some of the cases that you are talking about, you, you mentioned common filters. That's a fairly well understood uh, approach to, to engineering this uh, channel tracking problem. How well defined or you know concrete does the, the traditional engineering solution need to be? Are, are there cases where you know the traditional model you know is, is you know rough or approximate? Um, and does this hybrid model work as well or, or better even? So, of course, uh, it only makes sense if the hybrid model actually works better. Um, so, yeah, so every time, basically what happens is that um, the, the model should learn to, to shut off when it's not improving the classical solution, because then the classical solution suffices. But if the model is rough, if the model that you think the world works is not actually how the world works, and so there's mistakes in that model, um, and you have sufficient data to train uh, these sort of more subtle patterns in the data, then, then in fact, this model will start to perform better. And we've seen very consistently when applied to many problems that you see, so you have a fully trained solution. The fully trained solution works very poorly when you have very little data. Um, but if you start to throw more and more data at it, it will, it will keep improving. Then there is the classical solution it works a lot better than the learned solution when you have very little data because there's all this prior knowledge in it. But then as you throw more and more data at it, it doesn't improve at all because it doesn't use that data. And so there's a switchover point where the learned solution will improve over the classical solution. And now if you look at the hybrid solution, it's the best of both worlds. So when the data set is very small, it will understand that it will have to rely on the classical solution. But when you throw more and more data at it, it will understand that it can now improve the classical solution by using the data. And you see that this hybrid solution, for whatever amount of data you're using, will always be below both these solutions. Now, if you have an infinite amount of data, the learned solution and the hybrid solution will about be equally good. 
because the the hybrid solution will completely ignore the classical solution. Mm. Uh, are there specific uh, papers that you can point us to that you and your teams have done in this area, or is this all uh, pre-publication? At Qualcomm, uh, the stuff is at this point pre-publication, but there's a paper, for instance, uh, where we applied this idea to MRI, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, um, where, we, where we actually uh, were in a competition. Of, it was a face, it's called Fast MRI Competition, uh, organized by Facebook and NYU, which we actually won off the tracks in. Um, and the papers around MRI, and we, we, so the model was called a recurrent inference machine, RIM. Um, so those papers are, are a very good indication of the of the general philosophy. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, another topic that I wanted to make sure we spent a little bit of time on is some of your recent work on graph neural networks and and some of the things that you've been seeing there since the last time we spoke. You know, maybe give us an overview of your your latest investigations in that area. Right. So um, so there is one paper maybe I, I could highlight a bit, which is a paper around what we call mesh CNNs. And so a, so a graph is not the same thing as a mesh. A mesh is basically if you have a two-dimensional surface or a three-dimensional volume, uh, people sort of break this volume or surface up into sort of little rectangles and uh, or, or, or triangles. And, and that sort of should cover the sort of the surface of the, of the object. Let's that's, that's, that's think of a curved two-dimensional object. And so you could imagine that you want to render something on an object. So let's say in computer graphics, you might want to sort of create the shape of a bunny and you would put this masher on it and then you want to sort of put fur on it. You want to render fur on it, right? So so you want to maybe, you know, render a high resolution sort of signal on, on that curved surface. And so then the question is, can we do this with deep learning? Can we actually train a neural network that, that operates or runs on, on the surface of a, of a, of a two-dimensional shape. And people have tried this before, but they've used graph neural nets, also in the medical domain. Uh, basically, you can think of a heart or some other, two, you know, or, or liver or some kind of, uh, sort of um, object. Um, but they've used sort of graph neural networks to do it. And, and the problem is that that's not quite right, because if you do it in graph neural networks, if you sort of at a particular point and you look around you in, in this graph, then basically the neural network does exactly the same in every orientation. So it, it collects signals from all the neighbors, but the way it treats all the neighbors is exactly the same. But that's not necessarily on a, on a, on a, on a, on a surface of, a, of an object. And so what we did is uh, we extended our work in gauge CNNs, which is this work where we use symmetries, gauge symmetries to, to do deep learning on manifolds, and we applied it to this kind of mesh situation, and we got some you know nice results and some nice theory out of that. So uh, there's also recent work. So this work with uh, with Pim de Haan, uh, Taco Cohen, and Maurice Weiler, and so more recently, uh, so Pim de Haan um, has also come up with a very nice, completely new graph neural network, which he calls natural uh, graph network. And the idea there is that. Um, so, so we want to do local computations in the graph for scalability. So we, we really want to make sure that our computations are of the kind, look at your neighbors, collect information from your neighbors in the graph and do some update. So that's a scalable solution. As opposed to understanding or doing computation on the entire state of the graph. Exactly, right? So the, the, the opposite would be to look at the all of the nodes and edges at the same time and do some massive updates on everything. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that that's very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to you want to do these local computations on the graph. So that's one requirement, and the other requirement is that you want to be you don't you don't want to be so limited that you treat all your neighbors the same. And so then the big question was, okay, can we come up with an architecture where you know both of these desiderata are being satisfied? And this natural graph network is a precisely a solution to this problem that is on the one, on the one hand more flexible uh, than the graph neural net. On the other hand, it's also computation is still uh, very cheap to run. Well, not very cheap, but at least cheaper than, than running on the whole thing. And, and what's the general idea of the way that these uh, natural graph networks are constructed or formulated that enables this? Yeah, it's a bit technical, but I can try to explain something. But the idea is that um, like in a sort of a convolutional neural net, you know, what, what is the big trick that makes that, that tick, which is basically you take a filter 
and you apply the filter everywhere in the you know on the image like if you have flat you know two-dimensional sheet like an image then you take one filter and you sort of slide it over the entire image you apply it everywhere the same way now in a graph that's a bit harder um, because you know every neighborhood looks different right some some nodes has five neighbors the other has seven neighbors you know and then the neighbors might be connected in different ways so the world looks different locally and so you cannot just share weights um, like you could do on a regular grid but what you can do is you can say well what if i have two neighborhoods somewhere in the graph which actually where the neighborhoods do look the same. So let's say these two neighborhoods are actually, um, you know, we could say isomorphic, what, what would you call it in, the gra in graph language? So they're actually the same neighborhoods when you look at them locally through a pinhole. Then you can say, well, let's share the parameters. Maybe I have to transform one set of parameters a little bit, you know, because I have to map it onto the other sort of uh, piece of the graph. But after that, I can basically use the same set of parameters. And this set of parameters does not have to treat every neighbor the same way. Of course, when you, when you treat every neighbor the same way, you can just share the same thing everywhere in the graph for every node. But you can backtrack that a little bit and say, well, let's only share parameters in places where the local neighborhood structure actually looks the same. Um, I think that's the core idea, perhaps, um, that both generalizes the graph neural net, which is more restrictive, um, but still can do these kind of local message passing updates. Hmm. Are, are there... Other um, kind of formulations of this graph idea that you're looking at that, that are uh, promising? Um, well, at the university, we look at um, how could you possibly generate sort of graphs. So, so we've, we've looked at that before, but uh, so you can take a graph and you could run it through a graph neural net to predict properties, and you can try to invert that process too, which you can say, well, what if I give you the properties? Can you generate a graph for me? And so with that, you can possibly you know generate new molecules for instance for drugs or for materials that you'd like to design yourself and i think that's a that's a field that's going to grow um, very quickly mm -hmm. and and again trying to combine that with symmetries that that we know about in the world which is kind of inductive bias prior knowledge we know that the world changes if we rotate our head right if i rotate our head then the world changes in a very particular way we don't get confused when that happens even though the signal on our retina changes dramatically. In our brain, we don't get very confused because we know how to transform these things into each other when we rotate our head. And so the same thing goes for graphs. If I rotate a graph, you know, the internal representations that live on the nodes should transform in a very sort of structured way. And adding that particular feature that we know exists in the world into these neural networks is something that we've also been worked out on um, at the university, for instance, with the uh, with, yeah, with, uh, with a bunch of people uh, outside Qualcomm at this point. Okay, awesome. Well, Max, it's been great having an opportunity to, to catch up with you. Any kind of parting thoughts? Well, you know, we could, you know, I don't know how much time we still have, but, you know, one, one topic I'm very excited about is federated learning. Okay. Um, so maybe you can briefly chat about that a little bit. So that's the topic that we do uh, research in uh, quite a bit at, um, at Qualcomm. Uh, Christos Luizos, for instance, is uh, is involved in that. And the idea there is that um, instead of bringing the data to the cloud where the algorithm sits, let's do it. Let's revert reverse that problem. Let's say, well, let's keep the data, you know, at the places where it gets generated. For instance, on your mobile device. For instance, on your phone, and then bring the compute um, to these devices. And so, how would that work? Well, um, you would have some kind of uh, some sort of central place where you might train the algorithm. Um, it would send, let's say, a message to these devices and it would ask, okay, can I access your data for this particular model update? It's a query you ask. You say, can I access your data to do this model update on your local data? And then your local device might say something like, yes, but I'm going to have to add a little bit of noise to this because I want I want to make sure that you cannot derive any sensitive information from that model update. And so it will then add a bit of noise, and then it will send you the model update, and you will update the model, and then you will go to the next device, et cetera, right? And so this, this is now actually a very challenging problem because the data on the different devices might have very different properties. The different devices might have different compute uh, power. You may not want, you know, you, you certainly want to privatize all those messages, but you may not have a lot of bandwidth, so you may want to 
keep the amount of communication between the cloud and the devices to a minimum. So there's all these constraints on this problem. Um, but still, you want to train this model in a sort of this sort of coordinated, sort of distributed fashion. And I think there's a lot of action happening now there in this domain. Um, of course, for, for Qualcomm, it's very interested because, interesting because we, we, we run processors on these devices, right? Our processors are, are on these devices, so that's why it's interesting for us. But more generally, I feel this might be the future compute paradigm where because it also solves this privacy issue, right? Maybe we do not want to send in the future all our data to big companies or to government organizations and all these kinds of things. We want to just keep our data. Maybe we want to even sell our data. You say, okay, you can get a model update, but you have to pay some for it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we want to do this in a way that whatever I send, I can sort of control the privacy myself. So I can say, this is sensitive data. I want to make sure that you can learn nothing about this data. Uh, despite the fact that you, you may want to do sort of a, a model update on, uh, with it. Um, and then there's other data, maybe I don't care too much about the privacy, and so you can have it. And sort of there's this whole interesting idea of maybe a market that might emerge from this where people have data, people want to train algorithms, and they sort of connect to each other in a distributed fashion, and they communicate in a, in, in a way that's privacy uh, sort of free, you know, uh, safe. Um, and sort of in this kind of whole sort of ecosystem models get trained um, on, on this just distributed set of data. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's something that we're working on at Qualcomm and um, and I'm very excited about it too. Yeah. Nice, nice. One of the topics that comes up, uh, has come up quite a bit on the show is, is differential privacy and you know, various approaches to um, using encryption and, and the like to enable these kinds of federated models. Are you focused on the kind of the, you know, encryption aspect of it or kind of the, the federation piece of it? I, I know that's a bit of an artificial distinction, but, um, no, no, it's, it's a very good question. So, um, so in fact, we are, uh, 99% focused on the federation and the distributed sort of learning aspect of things and making sure that we can train these models well, but there is very interesting ideas around encryption too. When instead of adding noise uh, to the data update, you can also encrypt your data. And then there's one particularly nice kind of encryption protocol, which is called homomorphic encryption, mm -hmm. where you do certain operations in the encrypted regime. So you can just add like a whole bunch of model updates that you might have received from different devices. You might add them while they're still encrypted. And then once you have the sum, you decrypt the sum. But the sum is a lot less privacy sensitive than the individual updates, right? Because an aggregate quantity is is uh, much harder to figure out what the individual constituents are, and so that's a very interesting and and, and uh, yes, yeah, an interesting way forward to see if we can uh, sort of train these networks in a safe way, um, but still send send very detailed information that is not noised up. The only downside is that encryption is typically computationally sort of quite expensive, uh, which means that we have to sort of then solve that problem. All right, particularly in a mobile and device-centric yeah. environment. Exactly, exactly, yes. Awesome, awesome. Well, Max, it's been wonderful catching up with you. Thanks so much to, for taking the time to um, check in with us and update us on you know, all the stuff you're up to. Thank you very much, Sam. It was a pleasure to talk to you again. My pleasure. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on today's show, visit twimlai.com slash shows. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.